I should say it's um, uh, thinking about here, planning to, you know, to talk to you today. I was just kind of reminded of being a not a very good staff nurse and ward manager on an acute admission ward about 40 years ago, so quite a long time ago. And I think for me, the connection around silence was I really noticed a lot when I was uh, you know, working on the wards day to day. And I also really noticed I didn't often speak to what I had noticed. And what I want to kind of talk to you today about is um, the role that kind of silence plays uh, in our organisations and how that's linked to kind of notions of psychological safety. Because you seem to be really interested in how do you help yourselves speak up and say more about what you're noticing as a way of keeping people um, safer. And uh, as I was coming up on the train, I was reminded about how difficult it is sometimes to uh, call things out. And uh, you may have had this experience, uh, it's a really serious experience on a train, sitting next to somebody who's sniffing. And uh, I don't know about you, but it kind of really triggers me. And uh, it kind of triggers the helpful part of me, the nurse in me, which is, God, I wish I could find a way of giving you a tissue. And it also triggers the other part of me, which is, why haven't you got a tissue? And it was, um, um, to my shame, I, uh, I, I didn't offer this man a tissue. I wish I had. But it kind of reminds me that, and the research I did around people who are constructively awkward, that um, I notice a lot more than I choose to talk about. And actually taking that step from noticing and kind of stepping forward and saying something is the key kind of moment. If you really want to keep people safer, you have to find a way of moving from what I notice that might be useful to talk about and actually finding a way of saying something. And it is, is possible. I was working with some... Um, senior docs yesterday at the King's Fund um, and uh, again you may have had this experience sitting in a group where lots of people are on their devices. Have, have you kind of felt that when you're, you're trying to do your best <laughs> and people are on their laptops taking uh, on their phones and um, again it's one of the things that kind of uh, I notice and um, I was again struck by how hard it is to go from that noticing and actually being able to, to say something about it. I mean, I, I, I did, and I did it without being rude or offensive, but um, I made it really clear that um, I was really curious about why people might be doing that, and it triggered a really kind of useful conversation about how busy people were, that actually they were trying to be in the room and manage stuff back at work. But the important thing is something was going on in that group. Uh, it wasn't being spoken to, and we found a way of having a, a conversation um, about it. And really, that's what I want to kind of um, share in a kind of practical and helpful way, I hope, that uh, simply telling people to speak up, to confront, to say more, in my view, can be insufficient advice. So that's a kind of my basic kind of thesis here. And what I want to do is kind of share what I have learned from my work at the King's Fund about how one might be able to shift from being silenced to finding one's voice in some situations. Uh, and I really want to make it clear, this isn't a lecture, this is work in progress. Uh, so um, I've worked hard at this, but, but I also get a sense it's incomplete. And at three o'clock in the morning, I was still trying to think about this. So I want this to be a spirit of, uh, of conversation between peers who have a shared interest around keeping people safer. And, and obviously by that, I mean patients and ourselves. So I want to test the idea that it may be kind of useful to think about how we can be silenced. And I'll talk a bit about how I can be silenced, but, but also how we can resist being silenced, who gets silenced and what gets silenced. My kind of learning in the fund is that um, the silencing of people is usually purposeful. Uh, that very often uh, in organisations, there is a desire to silence certain realities in, in the organisation. And that all of those things together can contribute to keeping people um, safer. So just to kind of get the academic stuff out of the way, uh, is I, when I was having conversations about how I might be kind of helpful today, was to talk, it seemed to me what you're trying to do was to kind of attend to psychological safety. And this is the kind of, Edmondson is a really kind of good writer around this, it's kind of recent stuff, but the belief that the work environment is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. The concept refers to the feeling of being able to speak up with relevant ideas 
questions or concerns. Psychological safety is present when colleagues trust and respect each other and feel able, even obligated, to be candid. That is a huge ask, I think, in today's busy, um, busy organisations. So, I'm, kind of, I'm not so interested in the kind of uh, the demands for us to behave differently. I'm interested in what, so what's it actually like to try and do that. And I think my sense around this, you can never evacuate anxiety. Um, it'll always feel kind of tricky and slightly risky to speak up and go against the grain. I think that's my lived experience. And I can see a few people kind of nodding that that is perhaps other people's kind of lived experience. And so there tends to be a gap between um, how we would like to behave and kind of what tends to happen in practice in some situations. And I'm interested in kind of what's going on in the gap. And I suppose I assume you're, you're also interested in that. And certainly that was the interest we had in the Sign Up to Safety campaign about the gap between all the good advice about keeping people safer and what actually happens in practice. And it's also right that in the NHS interim, in People Planned, there is yet more focus on uh, that people like yourselves should be able to feel free enough to speak up and not to be subject to incivility, bullying, harassment. But I guess that it's come up again, suggests that it's still, <laughs> it, is, it is an ever-present part of organisational um, life. So I'm not going to talk for an hour which may be reassuring for some of you. Uh, when I said to some of my colleagues at the fund um, that I was being asked to speak for an hour, uh, they just basically told me I wasn't that interesting and that maybe I should kind of stick to 20 minutes. So that's my kind of plan. But I think in order to kind of feel that this is useful, I, I kind of want to pose a question, a kind of catalytic question for you to kind of consider um, after I've kind of spoken for about 20 minutes. <clears throat> so if you had greater psychological safety, what would you talk about? So I can't, I'm assuming that your interest in increasing psychological safety is speaking to a sense that more is going on than you're able to currently speak about, and that if you could speak to it, it might be useful in terms of keeping people safer. So I kind of want to pose that question. And if you were to talk more, who would benefit? And, uh, and what stops you at the moment? <clears throat> and in a way, the last question is the one that kind of gives you a bit of a leverage on your current culture. And I, I kind of really want to stress that I spend a lot of time talking to people who are trying to do this. And this is really hard, serious work. And I don't think it's immediately clear how to do it. So some of this requires kind of making it up as you um, go along. And I also spend a lot of time, as perhaps you might do, who are on the receiving end of unsafe cultures. And I'll, I'll kind of describe some of that um, in a minute. So does that sound like a kind of useful question to kind of just focus your kind of inquiry? Yeah? Because this it's pretty difficult to have a kind of conversation in this kind of setting. Um, but what I'm inviting you to do is kind of bring your lived experience to what I have to say and to test it. But you shouldn't listen to me uncritically. It has to kind of in some way relate to your lived experience. This is a picture of me. My mum would be so proud that I found a way of putting that up. Um, I think I'm about, uh, I don't know, four, three, four, I don't know, a long time ago. And, um, and I put it up here because um, I want to suggest to you that we learn how to behave. We learn how to um, carry out conversations. And that one of the things you might find useful is to kind of try and understand how you, the culture of conversations you have in the trust across this large geography and now including even another um, trust. But I want to suggest to you that we learn how to behave in relation to conversations. And, that is, and we bring that into our adult life. So there's me, white, European, second son. Um, what... I learned was how to um, manage myself when I was in disagreement with people around me, which basically was be, um, good, being good and being polite was wrapped up with um, being quiet and not questioning or arguing with, particularly with my elderly grandmother, who had particularly right-wing views, even at that age, I realised. Um, 
But what I want to suggest to you is that um, we can learn to be uh, silent, to be compliant. And it'd be quite useful sometimes to think about, so how is it, how have I learned how to kind of take up my authority? How have I learned to use my voice? And how have I learned to use my voice when I really want to go against the grain and say difficult things and to contradict and to argue? Yeah? Does that make some kind of connection to you? And, um, but uh, my parents were quite kind of contrary in a way, so, um, and a bit split, I think. And um, so at one level, I learned to be this kind of quiet, good, well-mannered um, young boy. And then something kind of came along and that really kind of changed me and kind of reminded me that, um, that you need something else. If you're going to kind of do the work you're doing, the work I do, you've also got to have this kind of ability to uh, kind of step out of your comfort zone. And when I was about 10, um, I had a really nice bike. Um, uh, I loved this bike. And I, I was in the park, and these um, three kids took it off me. And, uh, and just nothing worse than a real feeling of kind of impotence as you watch your treasured possession being ridden around the car park, and, and, you, and you can't kind of get it back. And uh, I, I kind of eventually did get it, and I cycled home. And I kind of went into the uh, garden, and, and I met my father. And, uh, and he asked me what was wrong because I was kind of blubbing, you know, really upset. And um, the next thing I knew, I was back in the car, being driven back to the park. And uh, his sage advice, which really shocked me at the time, he says, find the biggest one and hit him. <laughs> so here's my dad, you know, senior civil servant, you know, really kind of straight. I was thinking, actually, I mustn't swear, must I? But, you know, oh, goodness, <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> And um, I'm not advocating violence, <laughs> but I am advocating that sometimes you have to kind of um, almost like kind of metaphorically kind of come out of your kind of comfort zone and find a part of yourself that is awkward. And I think it's no surprise that, you know, back in the uh, 2008, my research, my doctoral research was into people who are constructively awkward. So people who can both comply, get along, be supportive, definitely be kind, but also somebody who's not a pushover, who's constantly kind of thinking about, so what's really going on here? What are we avoiding? And that in order to do that, um, it requires a kind of, almost like a different part of myself. I will be forever grateful to my dad for kind of uh, teaching me that um, uh, lesson. And I suppose you've got to kind of pay attention to uh, the conversational um, uh, a culture, and this is a kind of writer, Theodore Zeldin, who's kind of written about a kind of the culture of conversation. And this may be really relevant for you because it's really relevant in the King's Fund. The King's Fund is kind of not, it was established in the 19th century. It's been around forever. It's kind of well endowed with money and it's full of people like me. And it, it, But the culture of conversation is... Um, uh, Ultra respectful. It can be ultra respectful, which, which, is a, which is a good thing. But Zeldin reminds us that you know, we have to learn that being interrupted, uh, being questioned, is actually a necessary and important part of working together. And that in some organisations, I have noticed that uh, if somebody wants to ask a question or to contradict or to um, ask why somebody believes that, it doesn't land well, as if, how dare you? It speaks to something around the culture of the conversations. And we can learn that interruptions are not mutilations, but actually they are part of trying to kind of work together, understand stuff. So I want to tell um, a kind of story, because uh, one of the things that um, in the King's Fund is I get to spend time with people like yourselves. And, and this is a kind of story that kind of reminds me, and I suppose I want to remind you, that um, we can be silenced quite quickly and um, easily. And it has real consequence. So it's part of my kind of argument that we really have to pay attention to how we talk to each other, the kind of language we use, the tone that we use. So this is a conversation that emerged out of a workshop on the sign-up to safety. 
and related to a consultant anaesthetist who contacted me a few weeks after the workshop and said she wanted to have a conversation. And it's the sort of thing that the King's Fund does reasonably well. It's a sort of safe enough place for people to kind of talk about their lived experience of work. And this conversation, uh, we had two goes at it. But the gist of the story was um, she had a terrible experience. Uh, they were operating on a very elderly, uh, I apologise in advance for some of the detail, but uh, on a very elderly woman who had stabbed herself. And uh, she was obviously bleeding um, profusely. And uh, she did ev they did everything they could to uh, save this person. And it wasn't possible. And she, came, she described coming out of the theatre, obviously in a real mess. I mean, she didn't go into the detail, but I was left with a strong feeling that it was, had been a, a pretty unpleasant uh, experience. And she met her clinical director. And... Um, she kind of approached him, I think, for some kind of, and it's not a word that's often used around sort of senior clinicians, some kind of comfort, I think, because the experience she had had really kind of pierced her professional skin. And uh, his response was, the gist of it was, uh, oh, she would have died anyway. And then the sense of he just kind of carried on. The, the impact on her was, was enormous. Here was a really highly trained, expensive to train, really committed clinician who was rendered completely dumb. And I think for uh, a couple of years, pretty depressed and describing not being able to kind of get out of bed, not really being able to do her, her job. So in a kind of 20 seconds, you know, less than five minutes, this really, really experienced person had been um, completely silenced. And we were talking kind of two years um, after, the, after the event. And it kind of left me kind of quite um, speechless. But it does kind of remind us that kind of the casual incivility, the kind of casual brush off, does have significant impact on people. So when we finally decided to have a conversation about, so what had really gone here? She described a catalogue of events that would make any sane person think you can't possibly blame that individual. And more importantly, she can't possibly blame herself. Because I think one of the characteristics I notice around uh, the people I work with who are working in the system is a kind of a real willingness to take responsibility. But I think this story reminds me that sometimes the willingness to take responsibility hides what really went on. So you then begin to get into the idea that sometimes the silencing of individuals is, a, is convenient for other people. That silencing is quite purposeful. Because when she talked about what had gone on, they, they were operating in one theatre suite in the morning and then moved to a brand new theatre suite in the afternoon. So you need to get the notion of unfamiliarity. Uh, when they reached for the, uh, that's not that I know a lot about this stuff, yeah, blood packs, um, they were really surprised that there weren't, wasn't the same volume of stuff that they were expecting. And uh, later she realised that the email had come from uh, pharmacy number 300, email number 300, telling everybody that that's what had happened. But basically... As I say, anybody kind of listening to this, you know, doing a root cause analysis, doing any, sitting down quietly with somebody would begin to realise this, this was not a kind of correct interpretation of what had gone on. It couldn't possibly be explained in terms of her own um, behaviour. But like, it, it was a kind of convenient way that the way the organisation worked in practice um, wasn't fully, fully explored. And I think one of the key things about people being silenced is that sometimes they're holding really important data about how the organisation works in practice. Not as imagined, not as people would like it to be, how it actually works in practice. And it's a really important kind of leadership moment where the people can bear to face that reality. And in that moment, that CD, with all of his history and all the things he'd been struggling with, refused it, didn't want to hear it. 
And it can be really important to kind of think about what are the, what are the things that we refuse? What is it we don't want to hear? Because if you're interested in psychological safety, you've also got to face the fact that if you enable people to say more, they may say things you don't actually feel comfortable with. And basically, it's like, be careful what you wish for. But if you're serious about safety, it seems to be really important for people to be able to say, rightly or wrongly, this is what I think I'm noticing. This is what I'm sensing. This is what I'm feeling. And to be met by somebody saying, that's really interesting, rather than, they would have died anyway. Shut up, go away, whatever, however it's done. But silencing is quite subtle. And one of the things you might really want to look at is, how do you silence each other? What are the subtle ways in which one gets silenced? Some really important research by um, Jack um, looking at, well, you'd probably be familiar with this stuff, but um, silence uh, and depression originally with, in women, but it's kind of later kind of generalised to men that we have quite a number of ways of kind of silencing ourselves. So we can be silenced by other people, but also we can choose to be silenced. And what she identified was the way I might silence myself is um, uh, others know better. I, I, I can't say this. There are more experienced people in the room, so I shouldn't say this. Um, I'm not important enough. Uh, kind of classic one, you know, I'm not senior. And I'm with all these senior people. Uh, I can't possibly say this. Uh, I'm fine, just kind of, um, I'm not anxious at all. It's fine. Yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, so external, internal, kind of full of doubt. And so, you know, inside, uh, I'm not smiling, I'm, but I'm holding that. My public face is, um, it's all okay. Which you can imagine can be really reassuring for other people. And sometimes people go silent because actually they feel there's nothing they can do. So my argument here is, is to realise that silence is an intervention in any organisation, any group, any team. Sitting there in silence is, is articulated as people's right, which absolutely is, but it also has meaning over and above that. And one of the ways to think about that is um, people are sitting there going, there's nothing I can do here. So I was in a breakfast meeting at the King's Fund talking about leadership, quality and safety, and I heard um, a venerable senior person <laughs> talk, and uh, I just thought it was, I thought it was so wrong. Um, he was using the word soft skills about this stuff, which I think is kind of crazy. And, uh, but I realised there's nothing I could say, because actually speaking up in, a bit ironic about to say this, in a group of 100 people is something I find really, really um, difficult. So I just thought, there's nothing I can do here about this. I'll just stay um, quiet. And sometimes people don't speak up because they're scared. And sometimes people um, don't speak up because they're protecting other people. At uh, the King's Fund, I worked with my best friend for about six years, and I absolutely knew there were some things I would never say to him out there in public because he was my best mate. But if you're part of a really close-knit team, and I guess I suppose I'm reminded of some of the work I did as a psychiatry nurse, um, you can go into some collusive arrangements. We really need each other. We need to pull together, so therefore we're never going to contradict and kind of question each other. I know you've kind of um, you had Dr. Chris Turner talk about incivility, but I think I just want to kind of briefly remind you about how that kind of plays out. So, as you can see, there it's the kind of the everyday stuff, the stuff that kind of tends to kind of get normalised. But I think what I want to argue is it has a massive, um, kind of massive impact. And um, so you can see this. You know, people decrease their effort. Um, they decrease the amount of time they spend at work. Um, intentionally decrease the quality of their work. So lost time, lost work time, avoiding people. Um, people said their performance declined. Um, Commitment to organisation declined. Um, they left their jobs because of um, incivility. And 25% uh, of people admitted taking their frustrations out on customers. This was kind of drawn from some American work, the Harvard stuff, uh, which was not looking at um, the NHS. But I think it's a useful reminder that the way we talk to each other, the kind of um, the behaviours that get normalised, um, sometimes can embed incivility. 
And we were talking about this um, yesterday, and one of the uh, people there just said, um, yeah, sometimes I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I've just done something that's been really difficult. I mean, she was a surgeon, but I mean, equally would apply to some of the work that you do. Um, and I, and I, th I do think that's a really important question that's not been kind of fully explored, is the nature of the work that you do sometimes means that smiling, making eye contact, is saying hello, feels like a big stretch. Did you agree? Some, some, yeah, no? Um, so what it requires is a kind of a, a kind of culture where that casual incivility is sometimes seen as a warning sign that somebody's not okay. And that asking somebody, how are you? You're not normally like this, can be a really important, uh, kind, supportive, keeping people safer um, intervention. And just, uh, we were having a conversation about um, whether there was anybody from the finance department here. Um, I guess there is, is there? No. Okay, but um, there's a really interesting economic argument being developed that actually the cost of incivility and bullying is actually being calculated at quite high numbers. And the reason that is, is that, um, that people are expensive to employ, and partly you employ them because of their thinking and know-how. And the evidence suggests that incivility really undermines that capability. So why would you not attend to the conversation of culture, keeping people safer, if you really want to, want to sustain and maximise people's ability to contribute? Because you're, what you're really interested in is their thinking and know-how. And that's the thing that gets undermined if you don't pay attention to psychological safety, notions of incivility. It's as plain as that. And I spend time working with people in organisations which are really under the financial cosh, and they worry about photocopying paper. You know, big, big FTs, you know, they can't do anything. But they casually talk about meetings in which people are spoken to in ways that if they happened outside, you'd either run away or as my dad would suggest, have a fight, you know. So the, it, in a way, it just doesn't make sense because people tend to deny the reality of, of this. So these are things <coughs> I have heard myself say when people have been on the receiving end of incivility and bullying and feeling silenced, which is, you know, uh, call it out. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, if I can't call out somebody sniffing on a train, it's going to be really difficult for me to call out somebody who I report to or is really important to me in terms of delivering. So for me, there's something really interesting to explore about. So what are the core skills and competences required to say, actually, we need to stop this? So if I can't do it on a train, you know, where can we do it? The other one is kind of talk to HR. And um, I'll be talking about some work I'm doing in a minute, which is um, a real dilemma between... Yeah, we need to kind of nail the bully. Yeah, we, everybody knows who they are, so they kind of need to be kind of um, dealt with. But it's a, it's a big public step to do that. And people know that um, it doesn't always go well for people who call stuff out. I mean, the evidence around the experience of whistleblowers is pretty... I mean, I haven't been in that... Uh, in such a risky position, um, but uh, it, it doesn't always go well. It's, it kind of reminds me of that kind of, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. You know, you're doing the right thing and the consequences can be quite, quite difficult. I've also heard us, me and people on the camera, to be, to be kind. We should be kinder. We should try harder. Um, be resilient. Be quiet. Kind of resist. And what I notice in people who have been really, in the work I've been doing with people who are on the receiving end of kind of silencing and um, being... On, of incivility and being bullied is um, they take it upon themselves to try harder. This is about me. I need to be more resilient. And I, I, I really want to kind of um, encourage a questioning of the discourse of personal resilience, which has kind of emerged. Um, what I mean by that is um, it is important to be resilient, particularly in the kind of work that you're doing, but sometimes being resilient is a way of not really facing how things work around here in reality. So when, I, I mean, this is a long time ago, but sometimes I felt I was working long hours with people who really I found quite frightening some of the time. And um, 
I really wanted to be more resilient and tougher and kind of more able to kind of cope with that. But what it hid, so it all became about me. And yeah, maybe I needed more support, but actually what it hid was a much more interesting conversation about, so this is the consequences of the way things work around here, that some people are feeling like this. And the thing I want to kind of focus on <coughs> is um, uh, how we might resist. I just want to kind of, and, uh, just kind of check in. Is this kind of making some connections to your lived experience? It's not as coherent as I'd like, but my purpose is to make some kind of connection to your work, because it's really important to me. That's what the fund exists for. Yeah? Nobody's sitting there going, what the heck is this guy talking about? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, it's kind of a dumb thing to ask. I mean, I, I would be t terrified if I was out there to say something, but... Okay. I suppose what I wanted to say is this is good advice, but it's insufficient advice. I'm not knocking it. It's just, it just feels like to me insufficient. Um, so um, this is probably way too much information about what I read about. And, um, but I no sometimes I notice what I'm struggling with by what I'm choosing to read. And uh, I'm... I'm so <laughs> These are really interesting books, but don't read that one on a train. Uh, <laughs> I had to read it like this. I, boy, it's, I think the reason I was um, reading them was um, culturally, swearing has a purpose. I, and I'm not advocating swearing. I, I just noticed that's what I was drawn to because I think it helped me surface something which was um, culturally, and not just in European culture, um, there are words used to signal that that we have had enough, or that a moment of crisis is, is, is emerging. And I was interested in, so how do you, um, if the advice is called out, how do you do that? What do you need to kind of mobilize in order to kind of go from being silenced to kind of stepping in and going, stop, without a bucket, a bucket load of expletives, which of course are totally caught up in bullying and harassment. So I'm not advocating that. I'm just going to show you this. this is what I noticed, that swearing has a cultural function to let somebody know um, I'm in pain, I'm hurting, uh, something needs to change here. Here's an early warning that this isn't going to work for me. And the other one, um, the book around um, uh, exploring everything. Has anybody read this about place hacking? I haven't done it. But it's a notion of urban exploration. And what um, he talks about, um, Garrett talks about, is um, uh, investigating spaces that are deemed to be private and off limits. And I think, kind of read that across, that if you create more psychological safety, one of the things that may happen, lets you know that it's being useful and successful, is that uh, people start investigating things that have previously been deemed off limits. So it's a kind of deep sense of inquiry, which then kind of raises this question about, um, oh goodness, what are we going to do now? So if I kind of make an example, uh, give an example. So, um, so I've been helping a colleague um, uh, who I believe to be on the end of a kind of um, uh, discriminatory process around her grading, and um, which has now been resolved satisfactorily. But in my interventions, um, I was reminded that I was treading in spaces that weren't my, I shouldn't be. And it was an interesting moment. You know, this is HR. So what the heck are you doing in my garden? And it was a reminder that, so the assumption I was being asked to buy into was, so every, HR is, um, it could be any old bit, um, it's, it's totally transparent, has really got a grip around the processes of subtle discrimination. Yeah, like heck. It's not to say they're not doing their best, but we all know about the kind of subtleties of the way people are marginalised, silenced and discriminated against. But if you do feel sufficiently safe, and I, and I did, um, one of the next things that can happen is you step into somebody else's space and they start to use their position or, or coercive power to get you to go away again. So this is not without risk. But if we're serious about keeping people safer, it means you've got to work below the surface. You've got to be able to kind of go into the nooks and crannies, the cellars and the attics, 
uh, where people don't really necessarily want you where you um, necessarily want to go. And uh, you know, we tend, as Robert McFarlane talks about in his new book, about kind of underworld, we tend to bury things that are dangerous and frightening underground. So it's just kind of, if nothing else, just a kind of reminder that um, if you do create psychological safety, uh, there'll be unintended consequences. And it requires a huge amount of kind of acceptance and tolerance of the people on the receiving end of your curiosity and inquiry to be as open as they can be. And that's why it's a kind of a collective leadership moment. So I want to just, um, I love these words, because <laughs> you know, go back to that picture of that four-year-old boy, yeah, I was never, I, I felt like these were never words that were really ever experimented with, but I think in order to exploit and feel safer, to confront silencing, these are the skills we might need to reacquire, to revalue. Stubborn, awkward, cussed, tenacious, steadfast. God, they're great words. That compliance, going along, cooperation, alignment are all really important, but they've tended, to, I feel, dominate the kind of leadership um, uh, theory and kind of conversations. That it seems to me that if you're going to explore, if you're going to make things safer for people, you've got to authorize a kind of cussed refusal to go along with what's happening. And it's kind of linked to the notion of, um, in the literature, around situational resistance, which is a really, again, resistance is a word that's kind of got a bad press, which is a kind of blocking refusal to be overcome. You know, I, I trained at the Tavistock, you know, the sort of psychoanalytic tradition. You know, resistance was, um, you know, you're just not kind of facing facts. You, know, you need to work harder or you need more therapy, David, kind of thing. But situational resistance kind of honours... Uh, the, our kind of social political history of resistance, which is sometimes um, uh, overwhelming forces need to be opposed, and you need to do that in a kind of safe enough way. So one of the skills that may be useful is the notion of situational resistance and valuing it, which is it is okay to say, um, I don't go along with this. I'm not convinced. I need to ask a question. And rather than that being seen as... Uh, you know, you always were an outlier. You just don't get it, whatever it is. Uh, or people like you shouldn't be saying these kinds of things. To see, just to pause for a moment and say, yeah, maybe there's something we're missing here. One of the reasons that um, we don't do it, why we don't speak out, why we're not, not cussed and awkward, is a kind of evolutionary kind of effect, really, which is our desire to belong. Um, and it's the one, it is one of the things that can really silence us. And um, I think it's best put like this. Let's go around the table and give an update on each of our projects. My project is a pathetic series of poorly planned, near random acts. My life is a tragedy of emotional desperation. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> it's more or less customary to say things are going fine. It, it, for me, it just kind of nails it. Um, the, uh, you know, the reason I didn't kind of speak up in the kind of breakfast conference of the fund was I didn't want to be an outlier. I didn't want to be outside. didn't want to be marginalised. And I would ask, invite you to kind of think about how you manage that dilemma between belonging, cooperating, being part of a team, getting stuff done at pace, whatever the kind of language is, and how that potentially can silence you going, you know what, that just doesn't add up to me. Or we're missing something or somebody or something is being ignored here. And I think it's a really hard thing to do, and I don't think there's any blanket advice about that. Uh, I think it's something you can practice, but it really helps if you have a kind of a leadership that um, accepts that, that, that that is a valued way of behaving. I think it's also really, really important um, that... Uh, the fact that I have intervened and asked to stop doesn't mean I'm coherent. It's, it's a hard enough thing to say, I, I need to say something here. It's an even bigger pressure then to make one's, you know, to believe that one is going to be straight away coherent, 
concise about what one is noticing. And what it then requires is people like bystanders, the other people to be supportive of that pause that's being created. But just because you've intervened doesn't correlate with them with being entirely clear. As I imagine, you must have had that experience of standing up, intervening, and then hearing yourself talk, going, oh, God, I wish I'd stayed in my seat. But if somebody says, that sounds interesting, what are you trying to say? i am kind of got that bit of that feeling as well. So there's a kind of cooperation around sense-making, then that's a different experience. But if you stand up, say something, somebody goes, shut up. I mean, they may say it nicely or, you know, that, that is a cultural message. It, you'll see it, you'll feel it, but everybody else around you will notice it. And it's linked to um, this. Most of the time I'm telling myself to shut up because I worry that much of what I'm about to say is either already blindingly obvious or extremely stupid. It really is a base, basic as not wanting to look a plonker. What does the fear of looking a plonker mean for me? It means that I'm left making a valid judgment about whether or not to speak up. And a plonker is a foolish or inept person. But this was part of the, my, um, the interviews around people who are constructively awkward. She's quite senior in the NHS, and uh, she kind of um, captured uh, the thing that kind of keeps us silent is, is this deep anxiety about looking stupid. And um, it's, it's a real great blocker for adults learning. Um, people like me uh, should already know how to do this. Uh, you know, kind of referring back to kind of yesterday, some really brilliant um, clinicians were in the room, but they had not a clue how to lead a group. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you might be a great neurosurgeon, but where would you have learned how to facilitate a group? And what's really hard for them is to say that, because everybody looks at them as an expert. It's really hard as a grown-up, as an adult, to say, I'm really good at this, but actually I don't know how, how to do this. And our anxiety about looking stupid, I mean, it's called learning anxiety. Ed Schein talks about learning anxiety, but I think Plonker gets it more concisely, um, it, it keeps us quiet. And again, how one is responded to when you kind of say something, it doesn't come out quite right. If you're led to believe you're, you should have just stayed quiet because you're an idiot, or you get help to try and... So what is it we're trying to pull on here? It's really, really um, important. And just if it wasn't kind of really clear, um, in the uh, mid staff report... Um, Robert Francis noted that, and we talked about this in the Silent Safety Camp, you know, the word hindsight and the benefit of hindsight. What that means is people noticed a lot more than they spoke about. So this delay in noticing stuff and finally being able to speak about it this way, they finally spoke about it in a very formal setting, um, in a way is kind of hopeful. People are noticing stuff. So the intervention is how do you kind of shorten the time frame between noticing stuff and being able to talk about it? But this is... Most, if you do any kind of reading around the literature and things going wrong, there's always somebody or some group who knew that it wasn't quite right. But it only comes out after the thing has happened. Do you want to have a conversation on your tables? Or? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Why don't for kind of 10 minutes, just kind of consider this. If you had a greater sense of psychological safety, what would you talk about? Who would benefit? And what stops you at the moment? And then we'll just take some feedback. Okay. Any kind of thoughts, connections? Something to be useful to hear? Yes. I, I, I think you say something really interesting. I mean, this is kind of work in progress, but um, it's interesting. I suppose I've always assumed the feelings are data, uh, you know, as in the kind of one's transference or counter transference. And, um, but I think it links to what you're saying about time, that I, I feel like I, when I listen to people in their meetings, it's as if everything is on the hurry up overtly focused on the overt agenda and no attention to what's going on below the surface, as if people don't bring their emotional feeling life to work. And then if you link that to task, so the work, you know, this is Isabel Mendes' work around if you're doing really difficult things with people, it requires you also to manage your feelings in ways that in other jobs you don't have to, and that kind of plays out as well. But I think the sense of giving it time and tolerating mess. Um, a mess is different to confusion. <laughs> yeah, the, one can allow somebody to kind of speak to how they're feeling and accept that their feelings may be evidence or data about what might be going on other than just about them. I've seen so many people silenced by 
then the interpretation being, that's all about you. So your anger or your upset, it's all about you. That's the explanation. Let's move on. That just seems to me dumb. It just seems to be ill-informed and unkind. So thank you. A few more? Yes. I did speak out, and the effect that it had on my family, on my emotional health and my physical health, nothing was resolved. The culture knew that this person was causing problems. Management knew, people on the floor knew. I was the one that spoke out, and I was the one that left. I was the one that my family suffered, I suffered, and nothing happened. And years later, I know now that things have happened. I know that potentially babies in that trust suffered, and I'm actually still really angry about it. Yeah, of course. And not. so um, that would actually probably stop me speaking out now. I, I think you say something really important that our lived experience of when we do it uh, really shapes how we continue to do it or to think about it. So I'm, I'm really sorry. I mean, that's, that sounds horrible. What it also makes me think about is um, there's another. So usually the role is presented as the, the perpetrator and the, and the target. The, I, I, th I think the, um, the key uh, role that we haven't looked at enough is bystander. So what other people were doing as this was um, happening. But uh, you're brave. Thank you. One more, couple more comments then. Sorry, yeah. What we kind of talked about, I mean, what, I, what we said was about people making kind of a cost-benefit analysis of every, you know, when anything is said. So what is the benefit of speaking? Yeah. Or is there any benefit of speaking? And the other kind of pillar of this is the person's kind of mood do they you know on a calibrated scale of one to ten how much of a damn do they give like you know so if they feel really passionate and angry about something and there's a lot of emotion going on people will speak despite the kind of profit and loss what they feel there's not much anger at that time they will not speak because they Point, yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, in the work I did around people who are constructively awkward, there was, you, people were able to connect their kind of emotions to, to their words. And that they, something needed to be put in motion. And it was usually some sense of affront of their kind of values. That something didn't land with them as, as ethical or congruent with that. And that usually triggered them to say something. But I think you're speaking correctly to the calculations we make about whether it's risky or not. I think what I feel now, and it's partly put by what you're saying, is that sometimes we can, it's so determined by previous experiences that we can misread what's possible in the present, which is why I kind of put the four-year-old of me, you know, for a long while as a, as a grown-up, I was still the four-year-old who had learned something. It's, and it takes, I think, conscious effort and the kind of conversations that you're having to begin to sort of, separate out what have I learned and what's the gap between what I've learned and what I'd like to be able to do. But I think if you want to kind of step into saying more, it requires, it's not just about you, it's about what everybody else is going to do when you step into that space. Because I, I've heard this story a lot, that when you step into the space, what you notice is everybody's cleared off. So psychological safety is safe enough to speak up and safe enough to say, I'm sorry, we're going to wait. I really want to hear what you've got to say because I've also got some concerns. So really assertively backing up the right, not you, the right to say something that is discomforting. So sitting in silence around somebody taking that risk is where I think lots of useful work could happen because otherwise it's all about the person who's perpetrating the behaviour and all around the person who's receiving it. And that silences as well. There's a lot of interesting research around bystanders, bystanders to stuff going on and how one learns to intervene. So it's, there's no passive roles when a moment arises where somebody wants to say, actually, I don't really get this. Everybody has to be engaged in that, I think. I mean, how to do that? I'm not so sure. But you can't, we can't just have it as a sort of 
uh, you know, interpersonal moment like that. It's just, it's, it's, that'd be the same old thing and le leading to the kind of experience that you've had. One more comment and then we need to finish. Yes. It takes a I think you said something really important, which is what gets exported to the informal structures of, the, of any organisation. Um, and sometimes that's, that's fine. You know, it's just, I, I, it wasn't the right time, I need to kind of think it through. But sometimes it can be really important to stay alert to what is it we can't bear to talk about in this structure, which we have to export over there, which then tends to kind of reinforce it's all about you. Whereas if you're going to do this work, you have to attend, it seems to me, how you run meetings. And the facilitation of those meetings is absolutely critical. And very often, facilitators or chairs of meetings are so wrapped up in getting their agenda sorted, they don't pay sufficient attention to the way by which the group is working. And you don't need me to tell you that in small groups or larger groups, we're as much driven by unconscious processes as we are by conscious processes. So it's a really kind of good thing to kind of end on is to notice what gets taken out of places where we could deal with it as data about the way this organisation works in practice. Not as imagined, but as lived experience. This is going to be the killer question, isn't it? I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to silence me, isn't it? Go on. What happened What happened? <laughs> uh, I, I, um, um, oh God! <laughs> Chasm has rules. Uh, yeah, I decked him. <laughs> <laughs> no, you shouldn't have. No, no. And I, I, I suppose the unintended consequences. I really, it was. Uh, I suppose it, uh, what it left me with was, um, in certain situations, I, I won't back down. And I think you, you can all find that in yourself. There'll be some situations in which um, you'll just say, actually, uh, no. And so, yeah. Good question. Well, luckily, it was out of time. <laughs> Thank you.